Hi, my name is Patrick Connolly and I'm currently studying business at Leeds Business School. In this vlog, I'll be discussing what is marketing, the different types of organisations and their orientations. I'll also be analysing the key marketing myths and finally I'll review what I've learned so far. All my references will be cited at the end of the video. So what is marketing? According to Dr. Philip Kotler, marketing is a science and art of exploring, creating and delivering value to satisfy the needs of market at a profit. Kotler also adds that marketing identifies unfulfilled needs and desires. Another definition of marketing by the Chartered Institution of Marketing 2014 is marketing is a management process of identifying, anticipating and satisfying requirements profitably. To break this down further, marketing is being ahead of the game, looking at potential opportunities within the market that you could exploit, executing them with the aim of creating a profit. Looking at marketing, it is important to address the different types of market orientations to which they are traditionally fall. According to Richardson, Kelly and James, market orientation is understanding of future and current customers, needs and wants in order to develop products and services that offer value to the customer. The first type of orientation is production. This goes by the philosophy of stack them high and sell them cheap, allowing to create a high volume with a low margin. This type of orientation is associated with the just-in-time. This refers to an inventory management system with the objective of having an inventory readily available to meet demand and not to a point of access where you must stockpile extra products. An example of this would be Poundwood or Pound Stretchers. Looking at Poundwood, initially the company sold an assortment of homeware products, end of the line chocolates and biscuits. Now it sells fresh food including mint, milk and bread and an array of other different products. Exactly for all one pound. More than that, most of the country's biggest manufacturers including Nestle, Kraft and United Biscuits now negotiate directly with Poundwood, making special value packs for their products for their discount centre. The second type of market orientation is product orientation. This is where their aim is to be a market leader and their focus is to make the best possible product for the consumer. One advantage of a product oriented business model is that it allows the business to focus on quality of the product targeting early adopters in niche markets. An example of this would be Dyson. They tailor each new vacuum so there is an improvement on the previous model by innovating the market with new, fresh ideas, continually to look at their rivals Hoover and their motivation to change. We sell what we produce. This is the nature of sales orientation. With a heavy reliance on promotion, mass media and strong branding, they look to take share from competitors by having higher awareness. An example of this will be a call centre and cold calling, a recent example of PPR. They use the mass media of television and strong advertisement campaigns in order to speak to customers and push their product on them. Fourth and final orientation is market orientation. We sell what our customers want. This orientation has a heavy reliance on market research that aims to add value to the customers. It seeks to identify customers' needs that aren't satisfied by rivals and therefore provide solutions. An example of this would be Walkers. The Duels of Flavour campaign, which ran throughout 2009, received widespread recognition in the advertising industry for the innovative and interactive way it reached customers. Members of the public could submit ideas for possible new crisp flavours, with the six best flavours going over to the public vote. There was over 1 million flavour entries were received. Market orientation business models seek to innovate and with products and services while having the customer at the core of their business model. Baines et al. suggests that developing a market orientation means developing customer orientation, competitor orientation and interfunctional orientation. It is key for organisations to recognise the importance of monitoring and adapting to the changing macro and micro environments. The micro environment affects the internal operation of the business to some extent can be controlled by the business. Porter's five forces can be utilised for looking at the micro environment. This consists of rivalry, new threat to entry, substitutes, buyer power and supplier power. The first is rivalry, competing with other firms to increase their market growth. If a firm can offer a unique product, it has an advantage over other competitors. The threat of new entry. If there are a few economies in scale in place, or if you have little protection of your key technologies, the new competitors can easily enter the market and weaken your position. On the other hand, if you have a strong protection, you can preserve a more favourable position in the market. In addition, substitutes are alternative goods and services that perform a similar function. If substitution is easier and substitution is viable, then this weakens your power. Supplier power is where a business is reliant on suppliers. If the suppliers do not supply, the business will fail. Therefore, the supplier is able to push up prices again and the profits of the business are likely to drop. The macro environment is uncontrollable by a business. These factors include political, economic, social, technological, legal and environmental. An example of this would be regulatory bodies such as the CMA, Competition and Markets Authority. 
and undergo a case as a merger of BT and EE. And this legal factor cannot be controlled by either business. If the CMA thought that the merger would create a monopoly in the market and reduce choice for the customer, then the joining of these two companies would not be able to take place. The first marketing myth is a strong brand is invincible. A prime example of this is Kodak. Don Strickland, a former vice president who left the company in 1993, because even then he could not persuade it to manufacture and market a digital camera. This strategic failure caused direct Kodak's decade-long decline as digital photography destroyed its film-based model. Kodak was a market lead in the photography industry filed for bankruptcy in 2012. Similarly, in the case of Nokia, although still in business, the Finnish company failed to see the growing importance of internet-enabled smartphones, dramatically reducing their share in the market, whilst other companies such as Apple and Samsung saw the demand and had their strong brands that we see today. Another marketing misconception is that the customer is always king or queen. This particular myth is subject to the business orientation. As I referred to earlier, walkers who adopt an orientation business model of we sell our customers one, would put their customers first. This view is shared by Richardson, James and Kelly, who would argue marketing places customer at the heart of all its business decisions, putting the customer as king or queen. Customers are demanding, discerning and demonstrated more now than ever before due to online channels such as Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. However, this isn't always the case. If you look at Waitrose for example, every employee is a stakeholder in the business. Each individual has a legitimate claim on management attention and the role of management is to be balanced to stakeholders' demands. This is known as a strong view of stakeholder theory, with every employee being treated fairly and the ethos to create equality shows that the customer isn't always first and foremost king or queen. The weak view of stakeholder view adopts the approach that the satisfied stakeholders is a good thing because it enables a business to satisfy its main purpose, the long-term growth of its owner wealth. A satisfied customer is always a loyal customer. While many businesses now try to promote, encourage and reward brand loyalty, it does not always mean the customer will stay loyal. An example of this is the Nando's card. Every third, sixth and tenth time you go to Nando's, you're rewarded with some sort of free food. However, although I could be satisfied with my meal, it doesn't mean I won't go to other competitors such as KFC and McDonald's that I could be equally satisfied by. This goes to show that satisfaction does not always lead to loyalty and repeated business. Wilburn argues that satisfaction is directed at a product's attributes rather than brand loyalty. J. Alexander would also argue that one-off transaction does not equate to loyalty. A customer satisfaction is measured by how much the brand needs the customer's needs. A big brand can sustain a higher price. In some cases this is true. Take it Apple for example. The high demand for their latest iPhone, the 6S, and they were able to sustain a higher price until their new model came out. It's important to note that it comes down to whether or not the customer perceives the good or service to be worth the money they are paying for it. It's evident that many people believe the iPhone is worth the money they are paying for it. However, in the supermarket industry, businesses such as Aldi, Tesco and Asda are in constant competition with each other. Because of the increased competition, they offer this price match against other companies for the same product. This shows that the biggest brands can always sustain a higher price as if they do, customers will go to a cheaper alternative. Advertising always affects sales. In some cases this is true and advertising campaigns can affect sales in a positive way. An example of this would be Dr Dre's Hear What You Want campaign, which deals with having inner strength and belief in times of adversity and believing in yourself to overcome, go forward and succeed. This campaign was an empowering message behind it not only to improve the sale of Beats headphones, but improve the brand and create a strong brand image. An example of where an advertisement campaign which affected sales negatively was the Sony PlayStation. To advertise the upcoming release of a white PlayStation Portable, there was a number of billboards and prints which depicted a white woman dressed in all white appearing to assault and frighten a young black woman. After thousands of complaints, the advertisement was subsequently taken down. Many, many customers saw that the ad saw the distasteful content echoing the slave trade, decided not to purchase the new product and certainly lost a number of sales. However, it is possible that ad campaigns, for whatever reason, don't affect sales at all, either, either in a negative or a positive way. Overall, the foundation of marketing module has given me a solid understanding of the key concepts of marketing, allowing me to grasp that marketing is an ongoing process. There is no start or finish, it is continual and never stops or ends. As the world changes, so do customers, and this is why marketing is essential for business to adapt and evolve with the times. Thank you for watching.